afternoon, and thank you for joining the inaugural From Pause to Clause Visionary 2020 series. If this is your first time, we welcome you for an informative moment. And if you are returning, thank you for your support. Either way, your Office of Alumni Relations is appreciative. We will continue to bring stellar alumni experts to expound on relevant topics that will support our recent graduates, as well as alumni who are seeking career changes or those who just wish to lend support. As always, we wish to thank the alumni panelists who have shared their area of expertise. We did not seek you out, yet you came running with the spirit of a mighty panther, which we are, sharing your knowledge base when, you call, when we called for you to participate. Before we begin our interaction today, here is a tad bit of history on the Office of Alumni Relations signature event named From Paws to Claws. The Alumni Student Networking event was originally designed in 2008 when Kareem Taylor, class of 2010, in his sophomore year expressed that students should learn from alumni. Over the years, we continuously call on the alumni community to embrace the alumni in waiting, commonly known as students. We encircle them until they become a member of the only permanent constituency of our alma mater. As Cubs, they develop through discovery, academically, socially, and spiritually, finding their way as their talents grow into claws and become fully entrenched felines of service, locally, nationally, and globally, while remembering to provide financial support to the institution that has helped develop them into well-rounded citizens. There is more to the program, and feel free to read the entire historical review in the alumni section on the CAU website. This newest edition is dedicated to the Perfect Vision class of 2020. As the alumni community, we did not have the opportunity to fully engage the class in the spring. As we begin our conversation, I would like to express thanks to my colleague, Chastity B. Evans, class of 2010, who serves as a program manager in the Office of Alumni Relations. She will be your host, for she created this space for our interaction. Chastity, it's time for you to begin our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, alumna Galen E. Gatewood Joshua for that wonderful introduction and historical context. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining your Office of Alumni Relations for the Vision 2020 series, Professionals, Value of Mapping Your Future, What's Next? Special thank you to alumna Dr. Michelle Rhodes, Program Specialist for the Office of Online Learning and Continuing Education, and for being the technical commander behind all of our webinars. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and go into the purpose, which is COVID-19 may have canceled your summer plans, because I know they canceled mine. Uh, 2020's canceled. But it doesn't have to delay your future success. Having become the Instagram or Twitter superstar you were hoping to be when quarantine began? Well, the next best thing. Quarantine provides an excellent opportunity to reflect on your goals and is the best way to achieve them. Understanding how to expand your network, increasing your industry and functional knowledge, and continuing to position your goals for future success. Alumni leaders, Let's discuss when is the right time to elevate the next steps and what we can do now to prepare for the future. Just a few housekeeping rules uh, before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. I will bring them up during our Q&A session to discuss. Are we good? We ready? Set? All right, let's go. Now, without further ado, introducing our first panelist for this afternoon, alumnus Reverend Sean Hasker Palmer. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is, I am so glad to be with you this afternoon, and I 
um, just would like to thank you for your time and patience um, and just the coming to hear a little bit about what we're up to. Um, and um, I'm not sure, Chastity, are you going to ask me the questions or am I just going to give the question and answer them? Oh, of course, I'm going to ask you that question. But I got to read your bio first. How about that? All righty. <laughs> so now back to Alumnus Palmer. With more than 15 years of experience in the field of higher education, Reverend Palmer has worked both in historically black and college, well, elite collegiate environments as an expert in cultural centers. He is an alumnus of McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia, and Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Before serving UNCW as the director of the Upper Man African American Culture Center, he was the assistant director of the Mary Lou Williams Center for Black Culture at Duke University. Reverend Palmer has been given several awards for his outstanding mentorship of students and student groups, as he is known for his creativity, strategy, and ability to counsel students in crises. He currently teaches classes in African American studies, directs a culture center that plans over 40 plus programs a semester, and occasionally does student leadership development around the country. Brevin Palmer is engaged in a number of community pursuits that include working in Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, participating as a commissioner on the National Park Services Gullah Geechee Corridor Commission, and serving both as the North Carolina State Director of the Association of Black Culture Centers, better known as ABCC, and is on its national board. His academic interests include Gullah Geechee people and culture, hip hop, Black religious traditions, Africana literature, and political science. Reverend Palmer is an avid reader, singer, and event planner. How nice. He also serves as the state stated supply pastor of the oldest Black Presbyterian Church in North Carolina, Chestnut Street. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Okay, all right. Reverend Palmer is currently working on a book project titled Black and Therefore Beautiful, Meditations for My People. We can't wait to read that. So, you know, just make sure you pass a copy on over to your alumni side, okay? You know, just... Yes, ma'am. All right, all right. So we're gonna go into your first question for today, but we first wanna say thank you so much for serving your alma mater today and for coming out and being a part of this panel. We could not be more than appreciated for you. I'm thankful to be asked. All right, no problem. So once we discover our professional momentum, we outgrow our current roles or job functions. We and coworkers began to notice ourselves with new professional eyes. And most importantly, so will new employers. Why are most afraid to move forward? And how, um, well, I guess, have we become too comfortable towards norms that are becoming extinct since you know, we're now in this new normal? Absolutely. I think that's a very good question for all of us who are <laughs> working and doing things. I think one of the challenges that Af for many African-American communities is that we have learned to settle for less when we deserve more. I mean, we are told from a, as, ch as children that it's gonna take twice as much to get half as far. We're told that we're gonna have to do, we're gonna have to grind and burn the midnight hour oil. We've, given, we've given, been given this notion of, that's called making it and we've never asked and questioned what does making it really look like. So what does the new, what does this person that we're trying to become really become? Like what do we really, what are we really striving for? I mean, so the question is, is it tangible? Like, is it like a house, a car, a dog, some kids, a wife or a husband or a spouse, right? Or is it something more? Is it to be a curator, to be thought of in our disciplines, our educational pursuits as an expert? Or is it something more to create a life that is full of meaning, uh, to build legacy in our local communities? And I don't think many of us have attended to the last few questions. What we've attended to is the questions that are often attended to around celebrity. We attend to the questions of, of, of fiscal wealth, 
because many of us grow up thinking that that wealth is unobtainable or that we don't like if we do a career that is not science related or um or or law or business related um that we're not going to we're not going to have access right and I think that uh, I think that is one of the challenges of living, um, at, being an African American professional in the workforce, is that we have to begin to rethink how we understand ourselves, and we have to begin to say to ourselves that we. Um, and I'll use the I'll use the I'll use the word that we're more than conquerors, right? Like we have to begin to say to ourselves that I will not fracture, break my stuff apart. And I think there are a few of us who are afraid of our own destinies, right? We're afraid of our own purpose. So we are comfortable with the few things that we use in the toolkit that we have that we know. So we know how to use the wrench, like we know how to event plan or we know how to tabulate resources. But there are there, but that is not the fullness of who we are, right? That is not the totality of who we are. And I think that one of the things that, that COVID is teaching us or this moment is teaching us is to go back or to what I would like to say is a Sankofa moment, right? Is to mm -hmm. go back and fetch it, right? We need to go back and fetch parts of ourselves that we left behind, the artist part of ourselves, the, cur the curator part of ourselves, the person who sang and did drama, that part of themselves, the fashion guru, that part of themselves needs to come forward, the, the person who tinkered around with policy, right? Like the writer, all of that is a part of this new world order, right? And, and it's a part of who we are. I think that the world desires, I think that we desire when we say Black Lives Matter, that we're, what we're really saying is that we need to be a wholer, fuller self. And that also needs to show up in the value commitments to the places where we work, right? Mm -hmm. So I think if, if we are afraid to move forward, a part of that is that we've been pigeonholed a part of that is that we are that we think that we don't we're not good enough, and I think that we want to be. I think that we're carefully constructing a world that is too bad is too much based on resources, tangible resources. And I want to leave you with this on this first question: Who can be against you if God be before you? Exactly. So, like my, many of us are, are clinging to stocks and bonds that could tank on Wall Street, right? Many of us are clinging, clinging to jobs that will bury us tomorrow, will help us, they'll give us enough burial insurance tomorrow, and we'll find a replacement by Friday. That's but the, true. Really, the real truth of the matter is, the real question, the real attention seeker, is who have I been designed and created to do, what, what work have I been designed and created to do, and is my work in a job? So like, is it just about my production? If it is, then we have returned to another professional form of slavery. If it's not, then I think we're living in the role that our ancestors might have imagined, that we would live in our own purposes. Our own purposes. See, I mean, and that's the perfect segue right into, you know, having that purpose to create value. So how can we create value? Because, you know, regardless of what we do in the workplace, we are hired to do more than just complete, you know, road tasks. Even if we are working in a toxic environment with less than stellar leadership, do we approach the workplace with this perspective? Because, you know, you still have to do your nine to five or, you know, whatever the amount of hours it is that you do in right. order for you to make a living. So I'll, I'll offer two, two things that I think are very valuable. The first is a saying that's com very commonly popular in higher ed. Uh, when you work in PWI space. Mm -hmm. I think that Black folk around the country need to have the confidence of white mediocre men. Because white mediocre men run the world. We know that, right? Like we see no ends to their running the world. And many Black people are overqualified for the jobs that they are in, right? They've not just outgrown the job, they were overqualified when they are hired. So we don't always go into jobs, we don't go into careers looking we think that we have to have everything on the on the objectives part of the job before we decide that we should be are good enough to apply for the next level mm -hmm. uh, i think that one of the challenges with black folk is that we have got to see ourselves as an asset and never a liability because some of the things that you are facing in your workplace are really just racialized microaggressions that keep you in a place and i think you have to see that though that there is no like if you are, if we're being honest about who we are as Clark Atlantans, 
that we decide when and where we enter. We decide the place where we belong. No one gets to decide that just because I'm late for five, five minutes late to a meeting after watching trauma after trauma on television, that I, that I don't have agency in place to work through my emotions before showing up to your meeting. Right. No one gets to decide that my creativity around black people and, uh, and about asking questions around diversity and inclusion are not good questions. Right. The, your parents, our, our ancestors gave us black righteous minds for a reason. And that is to utilize those black righteous minds when we are doing the work. The other thing that I really, 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 really believe is that slavery has tricked us into believing that our value is found in our productivity. I'll say it again, our value is found in our productivity. Value is never found in productivity because if we reduce ourselves to how much we produce, we're black back on an auction block. So we have to move away from things that reduce us to, that require us to reduce ourselves to how many widgets we can provide for some company that's gonna make a multi-million dollars off of our work where they're gonna pay us a thousand dollars, right? So again, like your value can't be found in the work. Your value must be, your value must be found in yourself and your value must be found in the ways in which you live in the world and that you provide and that you provide for your family and the ways in which you come to create spaces and open doors for other people. There's way more ways to think about value. So I think that like whether you are a teacher, an educator, or whether you're a business person, or whether you're a lawyer, that you have to think of yourself as having value beyond what some person in some fictitious office who is mediocre can provide for you. Regardless of whether you make $10,000 or $150,000, on the West Coast, you need like 2 million, right? So you gotta make that, you got, but, but like, even if you don't have any of that, you still are valuable. You're still, as Zora Neale Hurston said, you're still somebody's love child. So like, I think about that often. I would say that one of the, I would say a way around this is, uh, I got this salient advice from the Duke um, Career Center director and I, it has stayed with me uh, since uh, my time at Duke, which is to synergize your personal objectives with the objectives of the spaces you work in. So no space should you go in that you don't have a creator, you, that you don't have creative agency in. You ought to, you, we ought to make sure that we are uh, synergizing our, in our time. Like we are reminding that when we come to work, that some of, uh, some of the reason why we're here, just to think about what Solange might say, is that we come here to do some work for us. Mm -hmm. So make, a, make that happen. I would say those, things are the, those are the things to the questions that you asked. I mean, that look, I, I'm loving your synergy. I mean, you, you are glowing over there and you have given us some, some, uh, some tea and coffee and you know, everything else for the rest of the week. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so. Thank you again, Reverend Palmer, for those essential tips and materials. And um, if you all have any questions for Reverend Palmer, please type them into the Q&A box in our Zoom control panel now. We'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Thank you again, Reverend Palmer. Great job. All right, introducing our next panelist for this afternoon, Ms. Alumna Taria Williams. Alumna Williams is the Senior Director of Communications for Turner Sports. In this role, she is responsible for oversight, integration, strategic and social media PR plans for Turner Sports premium sports content, including the NBA, oh, excuse me, so sorry, kind of uh, took it away, Major League Baseball, NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Championship, E-League, and more. Additionally, Alumna Williams leads PR efforts supporting all live events and special projects, including the NBA Awards on TNT, All-Star Roadshow, and the annual NCAA March Madness Music Festival. Alumna Williams works diligently with the sports industry and community. She was named to Rolling Out Magazine's 2015 list of top 25 women in Atlanta, she is the founder of Power, an intensive boot camp that allows PR students an opportunity to develop and execute real public relations campaigns while also building relationships with current PR professionals. Additionally, she, she serves on the Sports Task Force of the National Association of Black Journalists. 
better known as NABJ, as Vice President of Digital and Social, and is a member of the National Association of Multi-Ethnicity and Communications, also known as NAMIC. She is also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Alumna Williams earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Mass Media Communications with a concentration in public relations from Clark Atlanta University, known as CAU. Thank you so much for being a part of this panel and for serving your alma mater, Alumna Williams. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I am blessed and highly favored, you know? <laughs> Taking it one day at a time, you know? <laughs> yes. So our first question for you for today, our network is made up of a range of people, including personal friends, family, and professional acquaintances. Some of these people are part of our network simply because we have pre-existing relationships with them. Others, we may have cultivated in a professional setting. Either way, the value of each individual in our network may vary enormously, depending on the situation of the movement or the moment. How important is it for us to understand which individuals should be placed on our A-list during a job search, networking events, or, you know, mentor list, because, you know, that stuff has to be present and it has to be important. So how important is that? Uh, first of all, let me say that I don't know if I can go behind a reverend that was <laughs> dropping all kind of gems. I was over here taking notes, Sean. Uh, I haven't heard you speak in years, and I was just like, wow, I didn't even think about it like that. So I thank you for that. That was <laughs> that was moving. He, he, he dropped a sermon on his own. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I can go home now. I mean, you don't need me, but that's fine. Uh, no, to answer your question, I think, you know, the audience is, is full of seasoned alums, recent alums. But for those recent alums, think back to when you were looking at colleges. I'm sure one of your professors or your guidance counselor told you to make a list of your top three schools. And in that case, your safe schools, your backup schools. So when it comes to identifying your A-list during a job search or networking event or for mentors, the biggest thing is to do your research. And that comes in all forms. When it comes to the job search, identify those companies or those positions you aspire to have. Determine if there are any connections between you and the person that you're interested in talking to, whether it's other people, organizations you're a part of, hometowns, favorite teams. And then when it comes to mentors, you need to find individuals that you admire, their work, their drive, their skill set, set up time to speak with them to get to know them better. And a lot of these can be applied to wherever you are in your career and your life. You know, one tip that has worked for me that I highly recommend for people is to have a board of directors. So in this sense, a board of directors is a group of individuals in various fields that you can utilize throughout various phases of your life. Your board can be interchangeable depending on where you are in your life. So do you have a friend or a contact that's good with finances? Do you have someone that can, you know, lift up a, a good prayer for you? Or do you have someone that can teach you how to cook or that can help you when you're trying to buy a home? These are the people you know and have met in various stages in your life. Some of these people you can meet at work, church, through networking, as a mentor, and they're interchangeable. You may not need them at your first stage of getting out of college to where you are now or later in your life. So this is my A-list of individuals. I know that can help me maneuver through any aspect of my life, personal or professional. I lean heavily on my board of directors. I love that. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> don't be surprised if all y'all receive a phone call later on, you know. <laughs> Or link their request, I'm just saying. Because, <laughs> I mean, that is very, I mean, I've never heard it like that, but that's that's an awesome thing to do. So I'll be sure to share this tonight on my LinkedIn and, and on Facebook, you know, to drop some gems. So, anywho, the biggest challenge in maintaining our network, though, is not meeting people, but keeping contacts alive over time. So I really like the fact that you, you know, bought up that board of directors, because like you said, they need to be or can be interchangeable but um you know we may meet an awesome person at 
an NABJ or NB NBA conference. But unless we follow up and maintain contact, the connection will be lost. So what do you feel are some essential tips you can recommend to everyone on the call today to take networking as a personal relationship? Because everything great needs time and attention to flourish. You know, it's just like a flower. It needs time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, listen, I have a networking top five. I mean, when I started in my career, networking was was uncomfortable. Although I'm very personable, I don't mind talking to people. It's one of those things that you kind of got to double dutch your way into. So there's there's a formula for good networking. It's super simple. One part online and one part face-to-face. -face. The face-to-face, -face, while challenging in today's times, is, is super important. So this was told to me at a, at a young age, and I've used it throughout. But when networking at an event, survey the room and make it a point to meet two to three new people before you leave. So it's kind of like you're just going to make a circle and find two to three new people before you leave. When approaching these individuals, introduce yourself, find out who they are. Don't start by asking what they do. Ask them about themselves. Learn about families, hobbies. People have lives outside of their jobs, and sometimes their careers make them more attractive on wanting to get to know them versus just as individuals. True. Always go in with the attitude of what can I do for you versus what can they do for me. Give with no expectation of return. Cultivating a relationship through networking takes time to grow like anything. And for those introverts that don't like to talk, do more listening. Ask questions about the individual and this way the onus isn't on you to do all of the talking. Mm -hmm. And then of course, most importantly, follow up. When following up, use something memorable from the conversation. If we bonded over the Real Housewives or LeBron James, <laughs> use that in your follow-up so that I can remember you in our conversation. And in your follow-up, just mention that you want to stay connected and let me know if you ever need anything on whatever topic. The continued follow-up is also good, but in periodic doses. You don't want to be overwhelming when following up. True. If you network over social, which most of us are doing now, see if you have mutual connections and see if that person can make an introduction for you. Cold networking, especially in today's age, doesn't have the same effect as one would hope. With LinkedIn, join, on a, join in on a conversation with a thought-provoking point to add to the discussion and use that as a launch point to network with people. You know, after you establish that relationship, Personal relationships, we do the same thing. Check in when you don't need anything. Holidays, birthdays, rough week in society, just being black, just cross my, you just crossed my mind. All of these are ways to drop a line to someone to check in. And remember, it's a two-way street. When building a professional relationship, you have to remember it's a two-way street. How can you be beneficial to what they are doing and what can they do to help you? It could be as small as reviewing your resume, telling you what books to read, giving you advice on how to handle situations or anything of that nature. And just continue to expand your network. For those of you that have just graduated or just starting your career, let's say you get a coffee meeting with someone you wanna meet or you talk to someone over the phone. The very last question, and I tell my mentees this all the time, is to ask, is there someone in your network that you would like me to meet or you feel comfortable introducing me to. The individual may have someone that can provide you more insight into what you are looking for or may think highly of you to connect you to someone in their network. This shows that you're on a mission and not just taking up space and taking up their time for coffee. You actually are trying to build and grow your network beyond traditional means. All these are tips that you can use at any phase of your career, just to starting out, transitioning into a, into a new industry, or even if you're a seasoned vet. I love that. And I really hope that there are some students on this call today to definitely take that down. Well, even, you know, young professionals, people that are in transition, you know, sandwich community. I mean, even older people that may be retired. I mean, it's still always good to network and know people and you know be familiar with stuff like that so thank you so much for that sure. um if you all have any questions for alumna williams please drop them into the q a box in our zoom control panel now we'll be sure to get to them during our q a session thank you again introducing our next panelist for this afternoon is alumnus taj tashumbi 
Hi. There he is. Oh, there he is. Alumnus Tashambi is the Vice President of Government Affairs of the Oakland Athletics. In this role, Tashambi oversees political business and community engagement for the team's new ballpark effort in Oakland. Alumnus Tashambi's background is diverse, unique, and perfect for tackling complex projects. Prior to the A's, he spent 15 years as a marketing executive for the likes of Toyota, Hilton Hotels, and Hyundai, and led strategic media and experimental, uh, experimental for partnerships, excuse me, with major networks and studios. His work has touched billions of lives through some of the most watched programs in history, including the Olympics. Um, say it for me. FIFA. <laughs> Is it FIFA? World Cup. I know, I can never say it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I watch it every year. <laughs> Super Bowl. When are we going to have one of those next year? I don't even know. Grammys and academic awards to name a few. Thank you so much for being a part of this panel and for serving your alma mater, alumnus Dashambi. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic, Chastity. Thank you for oh, having me. No problem. No problem at all. So your first question for today is, of course, based in sports. So in sports, psychological professional momentum has been, uh, well, has been defined as a bi-directional concept affecting either the probability of winning or the probability of losing as a function of the outcome of the preceding event. It also has been defined in relation to perceptions of moving towards a goal. It is important to note that the professional momentum in any industry can be positive, where almost everything seems to go right, or negative, where everything seems to always go wrong, like this year, for instance. Right. You, have kept, <laughs> you have kept A's in Oakland because you remained it grounded, positive, and have the momentum. How can we, or CAU as a whole, learn from your professional momentum? Wow, I've been trying to study this question, you know, for the last few days to to make sure I had a really profound answer because oh, my I'm colleague, sure not a cake, but <laughs> after listening to to the Reverend and to Rhea, I'm I'm certainly in awe of of both of them because we were in school at the same time and you know I love them and remember them vividly. So thank you guys for for being a part of this as well. I would just say this: everything that I've done in my career since I left Clark Atlanta University has been rooted in our mantra and the Clark, the Clark College mantra at that, which is find a way or make one. Because for me, my entire trailblazing in my career has been a result of that reminder and that institutional knowledge. And I think without that, we lose sight of our potential as the Reverend mentioned. You know, we have agency to not only be at the forefront of society, but we have an opportunity to change the world. And so through my efforts in Oakland with the A's, that's essentially what I've been doing. I've been taking my HBCU experience and bringing that into corporate America and bringing that into boardrooms and places where we typically don't have a seat. And I feel like Clark Atlanta has an opportunity to understand that you have alumni all over the world doing amazing things that have been educated and been taught and nurtured from our environment, from our home institution. And we've taken that knowledge and transformed our behaviors through our personal lives and through our professional lives and really made an, an immense impact on the aspects of which we learned. And I think Clark needs to take an opportunity to not only give themselves a hand clap but also to see the institutional knowledge that we produce can also be led through the efforts that are taking place at the institution on a daily basis. So one of the things I feel like we can do in this particular time frame is exactly what we're doing now, is bring alumni back into the fold, bring us back so that we can share our experiences, so we can give back our knowledge, our expertise, our resources to the institution and to the community as a whole so that we can really contribute and pay it forward, right? For not only the students who are there now, but for our entire network, because we have such a strong group of people who've come from Clark, but a lot of us don't know each other, exactly. or we 
connected. So this is an amazing platform for us to do that. And just to give you a quick example, I was a couple minutes late today, so I apologize. And I have a good reason for being late. And, and Sean maybe can attest to this because I was late sometimes going to school at Wright Hall. But listen, you know, I always had a good excuse for my professors. Today's excuse is really good, though. I've been working with Major League Baseball. Our opening day is actually today and tomorrow. Leagues will, the, both leagues, the Major, American League and the uh, National League are kicking off today and tomorrow. My team's opening day is tomorrow. And we're making a huge statement as it relates to the social injustice in our country right now. We are, such as the NBA did this as well the other day, we're going to have Black Lives Matter on the field of every pro baseball team in America beginning nice. to um, Amazing. Oh my gosh. And this came from CAU. This came, this idea came from CAU. All and right, I said, gosh. wait a minute now. Make sure you post <laughs> that now so we can reshare that now, okay? So Listen, you let us know exactly when you're posting it. Absolutely. It's, it's, right. it's, it was on Sports Center last night at around 12 a.m. It, it came on Sports Center. You can tell me what? Yeah, and you know, this was something I fought for. I fought for this to happen because not only is it important to acknowledge, but this is the type of leadership that our alumni and our network has. So CAU, we need to be thinking about what is going to be our call to action, right? For our institution, for HBCUs, for the entire country, for the city of Atlanta, for the state of Georgia. There is so much going on that's polarizing the country right now. What can CAU do to make a stand, to take, a, to take an opportunity to differentiate itself from everybody else? So my career, my work right now, that's all I'm focused on. All I'm focused on is not being afraid of my greatness, not being afraid of my potential. And the Reverend made that very clear. I think we need to take ownership for the things that we already own. Mm. We need to take ownership of the things we already own. Our birthright is to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. Our birth responsibility is to give back based upon the blood of our ancestors. So this is our moment. This is the time to do that. Exactly. And I'm sorry for a long-winded answer, but I'm fired up this morning. I feel like I should be. Yeah, I said, boo, boo, you know, you go, boy. In the words of Martin, I just changed out, girl, you know, you, you, you got it. But um, definitely, I love that. Don't be afraid of your greatness. Okay, so y'all don't, you know, if y'all follow me, whatever, don't be mad if I start uh, tweeting y'all and quoting y'all, you know, if y'all be like, oh my gosh, you're this random person. I'm like, hey guys, how y'all doing? Okay. But anywho, <laughs> you know, it's always good to have some fun. You gotta laugh, especially in this pandemic. You know what I'm saying? I mean, things is too serious. But um. I guess to say what works for you because momentum falls hard in both of your target categories, sports and government affairs. Do you sense that our professional momentum will continue to be an important factor in performance as long as we continue to play aggressively, aim for the prize and continue to think positive? So what works for you? How do you keep moving? Yeah, I'll make it, I'll make it brief because I know we got to get to Charmaine. So listen, everybody, <laughs> everybody on here, I mean, first of all, please text a friend and tell him to tune in because we want as many of our alumni to tune into this as possible on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. Yeah. We need to think about a couple of things and I'm going to be done. What are we really contributing to right now? Mm. As a, right? Like, what are we contributing to? Black Lives Matter. I interviewed the founder yesterday of Black Lives Matter, Alicia Garza. She's one of the co-founders. Three sisters. I interviewed one of the three yesterday. For the, for the A's. And I have a series of conversations that I'm leading every week with leaders in the community, politicians, entertainers, and it's called A Conversation About Race, Reflection and Action. It's on YouTube Live yeah. every Friday. And what I would like to see people do is not only take advantage of this moment, but understand that again, this is our birthright and our birth responsibility to give back and to pay it forward. If we do not do that right now, we are a lost generation. We are completely lost. 
this is the moment of reconciliation for black people in the world. This is the time. There is no better opportunity than right now, than right now, for us to wake up. If you have a complaint at the job, this is the time to speak up. If you have an issue as it relates to how you are misunderstood, this is the time to course correct. If you don't understand your, your professional pedigree, this is the time to go within and champion where you need to be in your life. As, as Sean mentioned, we are overqualified and underrepresented. Our, our undercompensated and overworked. So this is the time period of which we need to reconcile everything that's happening in our world. So without further ado, I feel like the purpose of our institution being an HBCU, there is no better moment for HBCUs to have a place in our society and to get funding and more support and more corporate dollars. If we're going out and trying to raise a billion dollars right now, we're doing ourselves a disservice. No, I said a billion, Chastity, a billion. Oh, I heard you. I'm down here taking all the notes, you know. Please. And I'm willing to call everybody I know, every corporation. Actually, that's what I'm working on. I'm trying to work on a HBCU specific for Clark, and then we can, we can get to other HBCUs, because I saw what Netflix did. When Netflix gave $120 million to Morehouse and Spelman and the UNCF, I said to myself, who can we call that's going to write us a check like that? Exactly. Okay, exactly. so that should all be focused on, and I'm gonna leave it there. Well, you just dropped the mic, you know. This is, I thought alumna um, Ward Milner was about to throw up the church hand. She was, she had her head a little too. I was like, all right, <laughs> she was bad. <vibing. laughs> Well, thank you so much, alumnus Tashambi, for breaking it down and for bringing your awareness. You already know this field. If y'all have any questions for alumnus Tashambi, please type them into the Q&A box in the Zoom control panel now. We'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Thank you again. All right now, so now that everybody don't bought, you know, the earth, wind, and fire, it's time for, uh, what's the other one? I don't know. We're going we gonna to be the uh, <laughs> Captain Planets. It's time for the devastation to roll, to, to roar. You ready, girl? <laughs> <laughs> so last but never least, introducing our final panelist, alumna Charmaine Ward-Milner. So alumna Ward-Milner is the Corporate Relations Director for Georgia Power. She is responsible for maintaining and building key state and national relationships with diverse organizations and opinion leaders. Her efforts focus on strategic alliances with diverse segments of the company's 2.5 million customers, corporate partners, and civic organizations to garner support and promote advocacy for important industry and company issues. She also works closely with internal executives and community leaders to develop sustainable initiatives aligned with the company's business goals and philanthropic strategies supporting its mission to be a citizen wherever we serve. Charmaine has held senior level positions with Georgia Specific, John H. Harlem, Bank of America, Showtime Networks, and IBM. She has created tremendous value as a corporate leader in the areas of corporate uh, philanthropy, foundation, corporate affairs, diversity, marketing, and sales. She is a noted speaker, serial entrepreneur, adjunct professor at Georgia State University, certified John Maxwell leadership coach, and an assistant certified coach with ICF, better known as International Coaching Federation. Alumna Ward Milner's service to the community is widespread, and she is humbled by the numerous awards she has received, recognizing her civic con uh, contributions. She serves as secretary for the National Black MBA National Board. She also serves on the boards of NBMBAA, Atlanta Chapter, Urban League of Greater Atlanta, Atlanta Technical College Foundation Board, Atlanta Business League Foundation Board, Operation Hope, 
and Alliance Theater Advisory Committee. She is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the Lynx Incorporated, and Coalition of 100 Black Women Incorporated. She is also an alumna of United Way, VIP, Education Policy Fellowship Program, known as EPFP, Leadership Georgia, and Leadership Atlanta. Charmaine graduated magna cum laude with a BA in economics from Clark Atlanta University and earned an MBA with honors from Kennesaw State University. A native of Chicago, she is an avid reader, loves the theater, and enjoys international travel. She is married to Keith Milner. Charmaine's personal mi uh, mission is to be a catalyst, creating positive change in individuals, organizations, and communities through coaching and servant leadership. Welcome. How are you, ma'am? Wow, thank you. Thank you. I, I tell you, first of all, I need a new headshot with my new pandemic hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> And second, I purposely asked to be last, and now I realize that was a mistake. But anyway, I am so inspired by the young leaders that are on this call. So inspired. I'm also mad, Galen and Chastity, that you have my year up there. Really? 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 Anyway, uh, so. As I that, my, uh, my pearl on the left here. side over here, you know. I'm happy to be here. So. Gosh. <laughs> well, hey, you look awesome, girl. So, you know, someone could have thought that was a mistake because they would have been like, I know she ain't graduated. Damn, I'm just saying, magic water. So, we're going to go into your question for today, ma'am. Absolutely. Okay. Our professional momentum is like a seesaw, a teeter totter. One day we are motivated and energized. Then the next day we are overwhelmed by all the stuff on our tactical to do list. When professional momentum is not always front and center, we never seem to have balance, professional balance. So how can we maintain our professional balance to ensure yesterday's performance will always create value and drive our performances for today? So how can we you know, have a little professional balance? Right. And so when you talk about balance, I'm going to talk about it. You can't talk about professional without talking about personal. That, that, that doesn't exist, right? So exactly. first of all, for everybody that is watching and listening, the whole idea of balance is really unrealistic. So there, <laughs> there is no such thing as balance. There isn't. Now, what there is, is balance at a moment in time. So this week, you may have great balance with work, with personal, you worked out, you talked to some friends on Zoom. Next week, you may be 80% work and 20% personal. And that's okay. That could still be balanced for that week. So what I want you to do is look at things week by week and figure out for that week, what do I need to do to be in balance? Now, think about the fact that balance is both physical mental and spiritual. It's not just one dimension. So when you look at your week, look at it in its totality, right? So what do you need to do? So I want you to keep a couple things in mind as it relates to both personal and professional. First of all, and I have three really specific points. What kind of person are you? So are you an early person? Are you a night owl? Are you high productivity? Are you a little low productivity? That's going to determine what balance looks like for you. Balance for me looks very different than balance for Sean or balance for Todd. I am a night owl. I am a high productivity person. My friends tease me. They say, you did more by 10 o'clock than most people did all day. And it's just because I mean, it's, it's, it's a gift. I thank God every day. I'm just able to get things done and make things happen. Everybody is not like that. So what you have to do is figure out what can you do to push yourself to get to your highest productivity. Now, once you have some self-awareness about who you are and what you can do, now you can create your schedule. Because if you really are not a high productivity person, to have a schedule that has 100 things in it, you are going to be very disappointed. You're going to be frustrated. For me, my to-do list, I'm like, great. I got 20 things on it. I'm going to knock them all off by today. But that's who I am. And so that's what balance looks like for me. So the first thing is to create a schedule that is reasonable and makes some sense. 
The second thing, when you look at your schedule, do not have something in every block. Do not have something in every block. You're not going to get it done. No one can perform at that level continuously, right? I mean, you might have a day where you're solid, but you can't have a week where you're solid. The third thing to do is to think about using what's called blocking method. So that is, I do emails from 8 to 10. I do a big project from 10 to 2 because that's when I have my most energy. Or the reverse. If you're a morning person, do your big projects from 8 to 10. And you know in the afternoon you get more sluggish. But I really like blocking. I don't look at email all day. You will never get anything done. So decide. I'm going to look at email from 8 to 10. I'm going to look at it again from 4 to 6. Whatever those blocks are, they can be one hour blocks, two hour blocks, whatever works for you. But the, when you just sit there and every moment you're, you're jumping back into email, jumping back into your project, there's no, multitasking doesn't work. I know we think it does, but it doesn't. All we do is get a little bit done on a lot of different things. But what's better is to actually do one thing and finish that, or at least get to a stopping point and then move to the other thing. So that's, that, those are the two big things. One is who are you? What kind of person are you? Number two is your schedule and how you utilize your schedule. The other thing is share your schedule with your family. You know, now that we're within the pandemic and we're all sometimes in one house, I mean, we are fighting over who's in the office, who's in the deck, who's in the bedroom office. I mean, so we, you know, I, I don't know about you all. So I, my new office is the porch but lately it's been 100 degrees and even that is too hot for me and I like it <laughs> so we sit down the night before and say okay who has something really important so I was like I'm on panel at 12 o'clock I need to be in the room office and I need to be hardwired in right so I don't have any problems with zoom and so we juggle that but everybody knows what's going on um, the third thing is is really taking some time. And I love the whole notion of mindfulness. If you don't know what it is, look it up, read about it. But it is being self-aware at a moment in time. And so it's nothing big. It can be something as simple as taking a walk and all of a sudden you see a beautiful flower to stop. Hmm. Take, take 30 seconds. Take 60, 60 seconds. Look at the flower. Clear your mind and breathe. I've done this sitting on the porch when my, my puppy got in my lap and it was just her breathing, the wind, and I just stopped and just settled for a moment. You will be amazed at just taking a few mindful moments per day, how that will help you in terms of your ability to balance. And the last thing is when you think about balance, here's what I really want you to take away. It is creating time to do what you have to do and creating time to do what you want to do. That's real balance. So when you look at the week and you say, this is what I have to do, but here are the things I want to do. I want to take my, my child to the playground. I want to get in a 30 minute workout. I want to read my book for an hour. That's real balance and it's different for everybody. That is amazing. I mean, I, I uh, have never heard of the blocking method, and I think I will be incorporating it because that seems very highly effective. And um, I'll be looking out for your, um, your book whenever you decide to, to write it, entitled Who Are You? Thanks. In <laughs> Thank you for um, that. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, actually, I'll be looking for all of y'all's books when y'all decide to drop the thank you. Okay. Yeah. Me and Gaylee and Elizabeth, thanks. All right, so as a result of taking yourself more seriously, you become aware of areas in your own professional performance which require improvement, and the decision you make next becomes the difference between remaining in an order taker role or starting to regard yourself as an innovator and a more effective leader. So take, for instance, Georgia Power. If a young alum was interested in being a part of the marketing team. How should they maintain their professional momentum to seek opportunities, improve their performance, and acumen to land that position? 
Great. I love this question. So I'm going to take two steps back to answer this question. The first thing I want everyone to know is that your career is in your hands. Yes. It's not in your boss's hands. It's not in your mother's hands. It is in your hands. So you need to decide what you want to do. That's number one. I meet too many young people that are floundering because they don't know what they want to do. And they, they blame everything on everybody else. If you're not moving in your career, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. If you're not moving up, move out. I'm going to say that again. If you're not moving up, move out or move sideways. It's not always out the company. It could be out the department. It could be out of that team. Move sideways, move somewhere, but you want to keep moving. And it's not always about money. It's also about getting experiences. It's also about getting leadership opportunities or getting new skills. So a lot of times I meet young people and, and I want more money, like more money, more money, yes. But sometimes you gotta say, is it worth it to be at the same level but gain this whole additional skill? So that's the second thing, is that I really wanna make sure that you know your career is in your hands. Number two, have a plan. What is your plan? Now, it doesn't have to be exact. It doesn't have to have, I'm going to do this in 2020 and this in 21, but just have a plan, right? And make it so that you can pivot. If this didn't happen, then what should, what's something else I can do? What's plan B and plan C? But at least have a plan. The third thing is, and this really gets to, you said, how, do you, how can you show up better, right? So it's a couple of things. And Taria, she said it. I had down here a board of directors. I had the same thing. Number one, you need a board of directors. You need people that are sewing into you and you need to be able to get feedback about who you are and what you're doing. Too often, we don't even know that we're harming ourselves because no one is giving us feedback or if they're giving the feedback, we have every excuse why that person's not right. The second thing is, when you think about the network, it's not just who you know, it's who knows you. So yes, you want to network and you want to make sure you know people, but it's also what people in that company know who you are. And that really gets back to, again, having that network. And I love that, um, I think it was Tari again that said, having people do e-introductions. I always offer to do e-introductions for my young people. Oh, you really excited about the CFO? Well, why don't we do an e-introduction so you can talk to them? Great. That's exactly what you want people to do. And then when you get the opportunity to talk to them, have something to say. <laughs> if you don't know what to say, ask the person who did the e-introduction, give me a template. Would you do role play with me? I have young people that say, oh, I've been waiting to talk to you, waiting to talk to you. I'm like, great. What is it? Crickets. <laughs> right? So... Have, have at least two or three powerful questions, right? You don't have to be prepared. And really, these are 30 minutes. Nobody wants to talk to you for an hour. I'm sorry, y'all, they don't. 30 minutes, have three powerful questions, get it in, get out, and ask for another conversation or ask for some action. The next thing is your brand. What is your brand? So people are like, well, what do you mean? Your brand is everything about you. Is what you say, is what you do, is what you wear, is what you look like. I know we want to think that those things are not relevant. They are. The good thing, the good thing is right now, I wish I had this when I was coming through corporate America. We can do this, right? <laughs> we, can, we can be much more of our authentic selves. I mean, right now with everything that's going on, um, top was right. You need to be asking for everything right now. Now, it needs to be within reason, right? You need to have, it needs to be based on data, based on performance. But this is the time. If you ever wanted to ask for that promotion or to be um, considered for a global assignment or to be a supervisor or whatever it is, this is the time. Especially if you've been doing a great job, you have a great brand. You know, you have advisors and mentors that have been saying, you know, you're ready. This is that time. So Todd is absolutely right. The next thing is you have to do good work. Now, I know you might say, well, are you kidding? That, that's number four? <laughs> yeah, because everybody's supposed to do good work. That's a given. You get hired because we think you are capable. We get, you get hired because we think you have the skill set that we need. 
I mean, when you walk in the door, you're supposed to be like on it. And again, you coming from Clark, I like what Todd, hey, you're supposed to live up to everything that we have been taught at Clark, right? So being able to do the work at a high level is a given. So if you are not a high performer, that's what you need to be working on. If you're getting performance plans and development plans and every time you get you know, your um, feedback, it's all of these things, that's what you need to be working on. Now, I do want to say one thing about feedback, and this is my husband's um, kind of quote that he came up with. All feedback is valuable, but not all feedback is valid. Mm. I'm going to let that sink in. I'm going to give Keith Milner all, all the credit for that. <laughs> so all feedback is valuable, but not all feedback is valid. So what that means is you do have to take feedback. You have to internalize it. You have to be really honest with yourself if it's true. And if it's not, put it to the side, right? It doesn't mean ignore it. It just means put it to the side. Because the other thing you have to remember, that perception is reality. So even if it's not true, how can you change that perception? So you got valid things you got to work on and you have perceptions you have to work on, but you still have to work on them. And then the last thing, the last thing is soft skills. Too often, too often our young leaders just don't have the soft skills. You have the hard skills. And I just want to give you an example and I just wrote it down. You know, hard skills are technology, analytical, marketing, project management, writing. You can do those. You can do the job. But the soft skills are the people skills, the social skills, communication skills, attitude. Attitude is everything. Yes. I mean, it can be somebody that has a bad attitude or they're always complaining about everything. Nobody wants to work with them. I don't care how great your analytical skills are. So when you think about the soft skills, is EQ, emotional intelligence, self-awareness, how are you coming across? How are others seeing you? And I know I put a lot in that answer, Chastity, but it's a lot to showing up correctly. If you want to show up and show out, then you got to come prepared. So you got to I mean, come with it. You got to come with it. One of the things I like to say, you know, don't stay, don't, don't get ready, stay ready, right? And that's how you show up and you go out. Well, all y'all came up in here today and just showed up and just showed all the way out, okay? I got a praise report today at approximately noon until 1.06 p.m. Thank you very much. And for everybody on here, thank you so much, Alumni Ward Miller, for the wonderful insight and the gems and information that you brought today. If you all have any questions for Alumni Ward Miller, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom Patrol panel now. We will be sure to get to them through our Q&A session. So, did you all have a great time this time? Because, I mean, didn't they show up and show out? They did. You did that, in the words of our young people. There we go. <clears throat> so, let me move forward. Um, it looks like we have a few questions. So, thank you again uh, for the questions. Please stay in contact with our alumni and look out for our upcoming webinars, which will take place every Thursday from noon until 1 p.m. Our um, webinar technology, uh, technology specialist, she'll place those up later for us. But let's get into these questions right now. So, let's see what we have. Hmm. Go into the chat. Well, it looks like the ones that you guys uh, had, they were already answered. So awesome. But for the ones that, because it looks like we have some more coming and we are running out of time. So I will definitely um, send those to our panelists and have them um, send them to you guys. But if you all would like to, please drop your um, social media handles that you would like to share in the um, chat. Uh, LinkedIn or Instagram, especially for the Facebook Live posts and stuff like that that you guys do and, you know, your shows or anything that you may be working on that's related, please drop those handles in there. So, um, going forward, immediately following this webinar, we will have a post survey 
So, um, you know, for those extra questions that we have, we will be sure to answer them um, during our survey, okay? Please let us know what you think about today. Your feedback is truly appreciated, everyone. Thank you so much. Well, great. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. Special thank yous to our colleagues, Senior Director of Alumni Relations, Ms. Galen, oh, excuse me, what happened here? Oh, okay. Ms. Galen E. Gatewood Joshua and Dr. Rose for their stellar service. And to our panelists for a remarkable job today. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you all on our next upcoming webinar. So be sure to follow us on all social media platforms to see what those are. Also, if you're interested in being on a panel, um, if your experiences match, don't hesitate to send us a request. We hope you all have a great rest of your evening, afternoon, and